Chapter 12. Catch a rising star and put it in your pocket. The secret elite were constantly on the lookout for rising stars in politics and the diplomatic corps who might serve them well as agents. They would nurture, groom, and fate them, and if considered sufficiently malleable, draw them into the orbit of the group. None would join the select inner core, and most were not even caught conscious they they were being controlled. Some may have guessed that they were indebted to an invisible force, but they asked no questions. As we have seen, determined ravenchists in France, such as Delcasse, were considered particularly useful, as was Izvolsky, who dreamed of Russian historic mission who dreamed of Russia's historic mission to control the Straits. The key to compliance was the mutual desire to achieve their aims through the destruction of Germany. Public office, lavish lifestyles, and personal gain were attractive byproducts. Ruthlessness, self-interest, and avarice, essential prerequisites. David Lloyd George was a politician identified nurtured and drawn into the secret elite fold for several very important reasons. They considered him a potential asset, unmatched by anyone else in the liberal or conservative parties. With his talent for skillful negotiation, the brilliant orator and audacious radicals held sway with the working classes. He talked their language such that even militant trade union leaders accepted him. He had shown courage in taking a stance against jaundice jingoism during the war in South Africa. Lloyd George was so immediately associated with the anti-Boer War stance and his attacks on privilege and wealth that his was the voice to which the people would listen and in which they could believe. Young, utterly ambitious and popular. He wasn't simply an orator at the time. He wasn't simply an orator at a time when the masses came to listen to great speeches. He was the inspirational orator of the age. His gifts with words was dramatic, full of sound and fury. Ridicule and righteousness were the hallmarks of his vitriol, burning ambition, the driving force behind his absolute determination to make it to the top. While he was determined to promote the social improvement of the lower classes, It was with even greater determination that he promoted David Lloyd George. It is worth repeating that, as early as 1886, he had written to Margaret Owen, later his long-suffering wife, that my suspense, that my supreme idea is to get on. I am prepared to thrust even love itself under the wheels of my juggernaut if it obstructs the way. Anything to get on. In that single phrase, Lloyd George revealed his ruthless determination and greatest weakness, ambition. Detractors have called him a man without conviction, claiming that he was shallow and opportunistic in most of his actions and at all times a man who did deals, and so it proved. Campbell Bannerman, including Lloyd George, in his 1906 cabinet, a radical balance to the liberal imperialists like Gray and Haldane. The secret elite understood both the advantages and disadvantages of his presence there. He was a figurehead around whom men would rally, and his opinions carried great weight amongst many liberal members of parliament. But how would he react to the vital question of war against Germany? Logically, Lloyd George was the man least likely to support their ambitions. If anyone could rally the Liberal Party in the country against war, it was him. Whoever he sided with would have a great advantage, and the secret elite set out to ensure that the advantage lay with him. That the advantage lay with them. Most crucially, no backbench MP or member of the public would ever suspect that a cabinet in which Lloyd George sat would secretly be planning war. Secret elite's option was straightforward. Either had to be turned or turned out.
Lloyd George's performance as president of the Board of Trade in Campbell Bannerman's government of 1905 caught the caught their eye. He successfully steered a Merchants' Shipping Act through that first parliamentary session, much to the benefit of the ship owners. His agreement to raise the Pilso line allowed ships to carry heavier cargoes, but made them less stable. Losses of ships and men increased, but owners saved eight pounds on their behalf. It was a strange concession from the radical liberal that gave rise to the accusations that he had been responsible for the death of British seamen in the interests of the ship owners. The Social Democratic Forum, led by an old Estonian, described the raising of the Pimso line as one of the most shameful things done to the working class of this country. Lloyd George has been officially murdering the seamen of British vessels in the interests of the ship-owning class. This man George is an unscrupulous and murdering rascal. Lloyd George was clearly a man with whom the secret elite could do business. By averting a national railway strike in 1907, he again attracted their approval. The Times called him the greatest asset of the government with the commercial classes. And he was subsequently invited to the state banquet for the visiting Kaiser at Windsor Castle, a sure sign that his star was in the, ascend was in the ascendancy. In April 1908, Lloyd George was made Chancellor of the Exchequer in Asquith's first cabinet, a remarkable promotion and one that raised his salary from £2,000 per year to £5,000. But was the rising star already in the secret elite's ample pocket? Had they intended to destroy him, they could have done so several times over. By pandering to his many weaknesses and drawing him into a dependency, they did the very opposite. Lloyd George harbored two serious cravings, a wealthy lifestyle and sex. Wealth and patronage the secret elite could provide in abundance. And he himself oozed the charm and dynamicism sometimes to, point, to the point of predatory insistence to conquer the opposite sex. From his earliest days in Parliament, Lloyd George developed a taste for the good life. His source of wealth necessarily came from others. Early attempts at speculative money-making were generally a disaster. He had been involved in a Pentagonian gold syndicate that failed to realize the expected fortune and is alleged to have tried to sell his shares to an unwitting investor after he discovered there was no gold. He progressed to the Liberal Party's front ranks and dined with King Edward. With typical immodesty, he wrote to his brother that he had made a favorable impression on the king. D.R. Daniel, a friend and companion in his early years, acknowledged that Lloyd George accepted funds from rich patrons without compunction. He stayed at the best hotels and dined at the best restaurants, had the most comfortable and most expensive seats reserved for him and expected to be treated as a, well, as a lord. It never seemed to embarrass him when he accepted favors. He exploited his wealthy supporters and they in turn fed his habit, knowing full well that there would be a payback. Lloyd George was constantly in trouble over his extramarital re relationships. Women were a damaging distraction, and fidelity was completely be beyond him. His daughter claimed bluntly that he had started having affairs soon after he was married. He blamed his wife, Margaret, for his serial adultery because she was reluctant to move from Wales to London. Lloyd George entered into relationships with scant regard for the women he left behind. His appendage was rumored to be as large as his ego, 
but neither served as adequate explanations for his sexual misbehavior. And of course, it landed him in serious trouble. As early as 1897, he was forced to deny the allegation that he had fathered an illegitimate child with a Miss Catherine Edwards, though that in itself would have meant his, his resignation from Parliament. He escaped being cited by her husband in court in rather mysterious circumstances. What these precisely were, we may never know, but mysterious circumstances frequently surrounded him. In 1908, scandalous rumors linked Lord George and Lady Julia Henry, wife of Sir Charles Henry, MP, a liberal colleague and millionaire merchant. The Sunday people inferred that Lloyd George managed to avoid being named as a co-respondent in the subsequent Henry divorce case because the injured husband had been bought off for rejection. The injured husband had been bought off for £20,000. Lord George looked into the political abyss and saw the darkness of final rejection. He was obliged to sue the people to save his name. Matters were so critical that the errant husband had to beg his wife, Margaret, to accompany him to court. According to his son, the desperate Lloyd George promised her, If I get over this, I give my oath that you shall never have to suffer this ordeal again. He was represented in court by a team of legal colossi, Rufus, Ruf Rufus Isaacs, the future... Lord Redding, and Lord Chief Justice F. E. Smith, the future Lord Birkenhead, and Raymond Asquith, the Prime Minister's son. Ranged, ranged against this vulnerable trio was one of the most formidable advocates of the time, the Right Honorable Sir Edward Carson, KCMP. Here was the man who had personally nailed Oscar Wilde to the public pillory, stripped him of any vestige of dignity, frozen the caustic tongue with which Wilde had taunted the aristocracy, and destroyed forever that self-styled genius. On the 12th of March, 1909, the hyenas packed the press benches in anticipation of a legal free-for-all that might end the career of the most high-profiled politician of that period. How many former lovers would Carson cite to demolish the Chancellor's claims of innocence and fidelity? What happened next gave rise to one of the greatest mysteries that ever surrounded the unscrupulous Welshman. Once Lloyd George had categorically denied the people's allegations, Sir Edward Carson, representing the newspaper, did nothing more than ask a few meaningless questions. There was no cross-examination. No witnesses were called. The trial was over. Lord George had been raised from the edge of the abyss and retained his parliamentary office. Miraculously, he was deemed blameless. He had been grossly, mis he had been grossly overrepresented by the top legal brains and England, but to whom was Lloyd George forever indebted? The people had retained Edward Carson, the most expensive king's counsel in the land, yet he failed to present their case. Why? What powerful strings had been pulled inside the hidden chambers of the legal profession? It is impossible to determine precisely the point at which the secret elite drew Lloyd George into their web, but by rescuing his career they protected their chosen man. The rising star was not allowed to fall. In return, they gained an asset of peerless review. His indiscretions had been so numerous that his dependence on their largest, that that his dependence on their largest, become so strong that he had wished to turn back. He faced political oblivion. There was no escape from the web they had woven around him. Six weeks after his court appearance on the 29th of April, 1909, Lloyd George presented his self-styled People's Budget to the House of Commons. 
a means-tested old-age pension had been introduced 12 weeks earlier and additional, rev and additional revenue was required to pay for it. The pension, which ranged from 1 shilling to 5 shillings per week, was for citizens aged over 70 who were living in poverty. Some 30 years earlier, Germany had introduced a significantly more generous old age pension, while the banner headline of the people's budget focused on social legislation, the 16 million pound shortfall in revenues was mainly caused by the additional spending of dreadnoughts. Much of the de much of the deficit that Lord George was trying to fill at the Escheker Escheker fill at the S XJK was due to increased spending on defense. By deliberately including a land tax that infuriated the gentry, Lord George designed his budget to provoke the House of Lords. On the 30th of July, 1910, he addressed a massed gathering at Lime House and waded into the conservative opposition. He directly attacked peers like the Duke of Northumberland for valuing land at 30 shillings an acre until the local authority wanted to build a school on it, whereupon the valuation rose instantly to 900 pounds per acre. In October, he roused the massive crowds at Newcastle by lambasting the House of Lords as 500 men ordinary men chosen accidentally from among the unemployed and claimed that they were forcing a revolution which would be eventually directed by the people. Churchill also joined in the provocation and Asquith did very little to control them. The bill's passage through the Commons took over 70 parliamentary days but was finally passed on the 4th of November. The next hurdle was the House of Lords bedrock of conservative peers and, heredi and hereditary noblemen. It should have been a formality because in over 200 years a finance bill had never been formally rejected in the upper house. The great debate in the House of Lords lasted six nights. Their lordships refused to accept the budget unless the country approved it through a general election. Uproar followed, but self-interested but self-interest won the day. In his warp, antediluvian approach to social justice, the gambling spinch thrift Henry Chaplin, MP, who owned some 4,000 acres of Lincolnshire, claimed that the old age pension was the greatest possible discouragement to thrift. Alfred Milner deeply resented the people's budget railing against the utterly rotten and bad way of financing old age pensions because the shortfall would come from taxes raised exclusively from the rich. He told an audience of conservatives in Glasgow that its consequences were evil. Consider Milner's words carefully. It was not the building of warships, the preparation for war, the commitment to Armageddon he deemed evil but provisions for the vulnerably elderly people in Britain, for the most vulnerably elder, vulnerable elderly people in Britain. His philosophy was straightforward and absolute. If we believe a thing to be bad, and if we have a right to prevent it, it is our duty to try to prevent it and damn the consequences. This was Milner at his most revealing, damn the consequences, so reminiscent of disregard the screamers, Lord Rothschild, who had vigorously campaigned for more dreadnoughts, also took up arms against the budget, denouncing it as the end of all, the negation of faith, of family, of property, of monarchy, of empire, in short, revolution. Such were the values the secret elite wanted to impose on the whole world in the name of the extended British Empire. When news of the defeat in the Lords came through, the great champion of the poor, Lloyd George, was dining at Frascati's, a top London restaurant in the Strand. Having been subjected to bullying arrogance, 
from the from their lordships, Asquith threatened to reform the House of Lords and greatly reduce his constitutional powers. He dissolved Parliament and called the general election early in 1910. Recent by election triumphs appeared to promise victory to the Conservatives, and their chosen government would have led by would have been led by Arthur Balfour, and might have included Lord Corzon, Lord Lansdowne, and of course, though he professed no interest. Alfred Milner. At a stroke, all of the proposed legislations would have been abandoned at the business, and the business of governing returned to their sa- to the safe hands of the natural elite. Democracy dealt them a very different hand. In the ensuing election, the Liberals suffered serious reverses, but held on to the majority, albeit of only two over the Conservatives, in a hung par- parliament. The Liberals survived in power thanks to support from both the emerging Labour Party with 40 seats and the Irish Home Rulers with 82. Asquith's government now depended on the support of the Irish members of Parliament, putting Irish Home Rule firmly back on the political agenda. There was frequent talk of cabinet resignations, but none took place. Asquith had not formally asked the King to create new peers and the cabinet was unsure on how it wanted to limit the powers of the House of Lords. Should it be elected? Did they require a referendum? No one had a clear view, and there was little hope that King Edward would rescue them. He did worse than that. On the 6th of May, 1910, King Edward VII died of a bronchial complication. That was in... On the 6th of May, 1910, King Edward VII died of a bronchial complication that was in no little way caused by his gluttony, his overindulgences, and his constant smoking. He was 68 years old and had been on the throne for nine. His intimate association with the secret elite through Lord Escher, Lord Milner, Lord Lansdowne, and others had guided British foreign policy into a very different 20th century, and done much to prepare the way for war. King Edward thoroughly disliked the constitutional change through which the Liberals claimed they were going to reform the House of Lords, and many Conservatives genuinely believed that Asquith had caused his death. On the 7th of May, Alfred Milner and about 50 other peers took the oath and kissed the hand of King George V. A quarter of a million people filled past King Edward's catafalque at Westminster Hall. It was widely rumored that in the conservative press that when Asquith came to pay his formal respects, Queen Alexandra told him bitterly, Look at your handiwork. Alfred Milner waited at Windsor to receive the body and attend the service at St. George's Chapel. He predicted that in the new reign of King George V, the British Empire would need would either be consolidated or disrupted. Milner knew that Edward, Edward, dead and the Liberals still in power, the secret elite were themselves in uncharted to were in. Let's do that again. He predicted that in the new reigns of King Edward V, the British Empire would either be consolidated or disrupted. Milner knew that Edward dead and the Liberals still in power, the secret elite were themselves in uncharted waters. Although they used corrupt politicians to their own end, men who would sell their souls to stay in power were aberrant to Milner. Even so, he was a pragmatist prepared to work with anyone who would advance the great cause of British race supremacy. The spirit of the dead king was invoked in a carefully worded editorial in Northcliffe's Observer. The editor, James Garvin, concocted a message from the grave calling for a truce of God 
as if the recently deceased king's last message to his grieving people was a plea for national unity exclusively revealed in the columns of the observer and blessed by the almighty his neck his text ran if king edwards upon his deathbed could have sent a last message to his people he would have asked us to lay party politics aside to sign a truce of god over his grave to seek some fair means of making a common effort for our common country. Let conference take place before conflict is irrevocably joined. Voice of the King. No, this was the voice of the secret elite. A former columnist of the Daily Telegraph, Garvin had been handpicked by Northcliffe as the Observer's editor. A true blue conservative and true friend of Admiral Fisher, Garvin was probably the last person to whom you might expect the liberals to listen, but they did, with the approval of the cabinet. With the approval of his cabinet, Asquith called the Constitutional Conference to see how far the two major parties might agree on a common approach and possibly even a co coalition. A newspaper stunt was turned into a strategy and it took 21 meetings of the Constitutional Conference before the futility of such meaningless time-wasting was recognized. Lloyd George suddenly found he had a new message. A striding critic of the conservatives in public, he became an advocate of compromise in private. According to Donald McCormick in The Mask of Merlin, in honeyed whispers, he was heard at the dinner tables of Mayfair to give the words coalition government, a melodious and seductive air. In honeyed whispers, he was heard at the dinner table of Mayfair to give the words coalition government in a, a melodious and seductive air. He held private meetings with Arthur Balfour that had to be kept secret even from his own cabinet colleagues. Lloyd George was apparently prepared to concede a stronger navy, accept compulsory military service, and agreed a compromise on Irish home rule. It was a betrayal of virtually everything he had originally stood for, a betrayal of the wishes of the majority of the British people, and a betrayal of his party. He did, however, safeguard his own position. On the 17th of August, 1910, he produced 29 pages of typescript that set out the case for a coalition government to unite the resources of the two parties. He proposed a formal alliance between liberals and conservatives that would have unquestionably sunk the constitutional reform. Britain, he argued, faced imminent impoverishment, if not insolvency. Well, he was chancellor and would have had access to the treasury figures. Despite the country's empty coffers, he proposed expensive compulsory military training. What, the great liberal radical proposing conscriptions by any other name? The conservatives would never have dared to go to the polls advocating this policy, no matter how much they wanted to. It would have been electoral, electoral suicide. But Lloyd George, if anyone could convince the country, it was him. His memorandum did insist on the passages on the passage of bills already proposed for land, unemployment, and insurance. But his view on con constitutional reform and the Irish question, especially the Irish question, were stumbling blocks. Finally, he turned his attention to imperial problems and his suggestions could have been written by Alfred Milner himself. Perhaps they were, for they read like a round table script. He advocated schemes for uniting together the empire and utilizing and concentrating its resources for defense as for commerce. The rising star was now very firmly in the pocket of the secret elite. Lloyd George's new philosophy, if indeed it was ever his, was a hybrid collection of ideas that would never have been acceptable to true liberals. Obliged by the command of King George V to cut short a holiday in Austria, he shared his memorandum with the king at Balmoral 
before he had given his own prime minister sight of the document. When he returned to his Welsh home, Winston Churchill and his wife Clementine immediately joined him. Churchill, of course, was more interested in what Post Lord George, Post Lloyd George had proposed for him than any other consideration. Contemporary observers were concerned and perplexed. Charles Hobhouse noted on four, on the 4th of November, 1910, the, that curious movements were taking place. Balfour has been daily at 11 Downing Street, the Chancellor of the Exchequer abodes, abode for the last fortnight and the fortnight and the last and the detail he wrote in his diary stated that a plan was afoot to defeat the government over the finance over the finance bill so that Balfour would become prime minister with Lloyd George as second in command Askwith should have squashed such disloyal behavior and it is absolutely untrue that he would have accepted proposals that effectively removed him from the office of Prime Minister. Yet here we have a new phenomenon, Lloyd George in furtive discussions with Arthur Balfour, the leading conservative member of the secret elite. Like many of Lloyd George's political intrigues, this came to nothing. His proposals reeked of desperation, and neither the liberal rank and file nor the conservative parties itself have ever likely to accept was ever likely to accept such cut and dried machinations. His less than subtle movers, his less than subtle moves to oust Asquith were abandoned on the twenty eighth of November, nineteen ten. With deadlock and stalemate in Parliament, the Prime Minister dissolved it and called the second general election. The result was almost exactly identical to the election held earlier in the year. Yet again, the Liberal government could only survive with the help of the Labour Party and the Irish Nationalists. This time they took divisive action. This time they took decisive action. A Parliament bill removed the right of the House of Lords to amend or vote down finance bills to amend or vote down finance bills and reduce their powers to reject legislation from the House of Commons. Asquith had been given a secret undertaking by King George V that he would create the required number of liberal peers to force through the constitutional changes. With typical public school bravado, their lordships opposed change from within by dividing themselves into two factions, the Hedgers and the Ditchers. Surprisingly, the Hedgers were led by Lord Curzon, while Milner, who championed the Ditchers, was actively working throughout to incite as many as possible of the peers to vote against surrender. The final vote in favor of change was passed 131 to 114, the secret elite had to protect the king from the embarrassment of creating hundreds of new peers, and they did not want to seek nearly 255 gloried grocers inside their private chambers. The Parliament Act of 1911 was hailed as a great victory for the liberals and a humiliating defeat for the conservatives and the House of Lords. Balfour was the scapegoat. Denounced by the National Review in an article headed Balfour Must Go, he took the fall, and leadership of the Conservative Party was passed to Andrew Bonar was passed to Andrew Bonar Law. And what was this great victory? Had the Lords of, had the House of Lords been crushed? Did hereditary peerage come to an end? Was there a marked reduction in the powers of the aristocracy? No, not at all. The House of Lords continued as a bastion of conservative peers, introducing its self-promoting legislation and challenging social reform. Yet the secret elite had established another important bulkhead in Asquith's cabinet and David Lloyd George. More, much more lay ahead for the Welsh former firebrand who had shown willing to go along with their plans.
He knew very well who paid the piper, and as long as he benefited personally and was maintained in the style and comfort to which he had become addicted, he was willing to dance to their tune. His star remained in the ascendancy, but its orbit had been dramatically changed. Summary, Chapter 12, Catch a Rising Star and Put It in Your Pocket. The secret elite identified and nurtured malleable politicians and dem- diplomats across Europe and continued to seek emerging talent in Britain and the Empire. On the face of it, Lloyd George appeared to be the least likely politician in Britain to be, to be brought under their influence. His anti-war rhetoric and aggressive stance against the aristocracy and landed, landed gentry marked him out as a man of the people. His performance as president of the Board of Trade in 1906 caught their attention because of his willingness to concede to the interest of big business. Lloyd George's love of the good life and his insatiable sexual appetite rendered him vulnerable. His career could have been ended several times over had the secret elite chosen to destroy him. Instead, they protected his reputation defended him against damaging allegations, and saved his career. Although his 1909 budget was hailed as a great step towards forward, forward in social reform, this masks the fact that half of the money raised was spent on preparation for eventual war with Germany. The House of Lords chose to reject the budget and the consequent constitutional con- crisis led to a general election in January of 1910. Following King Edward VII's death, the secret elite promoted the idea of a coalition government comprising all their main political agents from both major parties. Contrary to his supposed principles, Lloyd George produced a memorandum that revealed an astonishing willingness to promote the secret elite's agenda. It included most of the roundtable policies on defense, empire, trade, and military service as a basis for the coalition. It came to nothing, and the second indecisive general election was held in December of 1910 with no change of government. What had changed was the fact that David Lloyd George was now firmly in the pocket of the secret elite.